guys, welcome to another episode of the A3 Review. That's right, it's uh, been a little bit uh, since our Mega Megatron Yeah, review. and they're still here. <laughs> well, you know, uh, truth be told, I've just been really busy with TFCon. As you know, every year in the summertime, uh, we have a big presence at TFCon. We do a lot of cool stuff. We work with manufacturers, make exclusives, blah, blah, blah. Uh, this year you're coming too. I am. Exciting. Oh yeah. It's, it's been a while, man. I know. Uh, so so it's going to be a lot of fun. Uh, we're going to definitely bring you a lot more coverage over the next couple of months, uh, doing some more reviews as well as some TFCon coverage. Yep. So definitely watch for that. Uh, but today we have an actual uh, special episode. It's not reviewing anything. Uh, but we're going to take a look at some customs again. We did this last year as well. We did yep. a special uh, episode, and there are actually quite a few people that uh, really liked it. So we thought, let's bring it back. Uh, let's just do a special segment on it, and let's talk about customizing. Uh, so in this episode, we're going to actually look at uh, something that I did back uh, a few months ago. And we took some footage back then, but yeah. we just uh, weren't able to release it yet because, uh, again, it's going to become this year's exclusive oh yeah uh at tfcon it's gonna be the terra aegis rally version and uh i did the custom quite a bit ago before um the con i did this actually wow last year yeah at, uh, quite the some chicago time chicago tfcon already yeah so you know we showed it off uh and a lot of people have wanted to see it uh in its you know full beauty and bot mode and everything uh, and finally it got revealed and it is getting a full production run. Uh, so we just wanted to look at what it took to get there and then also look at another custom that I did uh, and uh, kind of bring to you uh, more of a customization episode again and uh, let you, the audience, learn about what goes into making these special products. That sounds like a pretty exciting episode. I can't wait to get right into it. My name is Alex. I'm Boris. And you're watching the, the A3, A3 Review. Review. So as you recall, uh, last season, uh, we did a couple of episodes where we kind of customized and did like a non-comparison, non-review kind of uh, episode. Uh, we did one for the, uh, remember the Devastator ah, yes. kit bashing? Yeah. Um, that was a fun episode. It was, yeah. and most of that episode was just like showing shots of me on the floor with pieces of Devastator yeah. uh, everywhere. And basically what we did there was we bashed three kits together. Mm -hmm. We bashed the 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 two of our, I think two of our favorites, the San mm -hmm. Diego Comic Con one with yeah. the regular devastator yeah and then we put uh i think a couple pieces from the japanese one onto yeah. it and we also threw on a uh the perfect effect oh yeah uh, third party kit for a good measure to, to make it the definitive <laughs> devastator yeah, yeah at least the one that we thought was definitive yeah. since then of course there's been like other kits and whatnot yeah so i won't talk too much more about that it is a little bit of an up outdated episode but it is still cool to watch mm -hmm. then we also did a cool little segment on the uh ocular max sphinx yes the stealth sphinx yes which became this uh production piece that we had the fortune of working with uh, Ocular Max on. Uh, basically, if you guys hadn't seen that episode, uh, I kind of talk about how I uh, did a custom uh, with that. Uh, I basically took a, a prototype of a completely clear Ocular Max Sphinx um, and uh, actually broke it up into pieces and took it apart and then smashed it together with uh, a fully done Sphinx and then uh, proceeded to paint over it to give it this kind of transitioning effect mm -hmm. if you recall Alex yes uh, and then that that product became uh, that kind of came to market yes um, so we kind of thought we'd talk a little bit again about Let's some again. customizing I know there's been a lot of people out there that are either interested in getting into it uh, there are also a lot of talented customizers that are already out there that are doing some really awesome stuff uh, so I wanted to kind of just draw attention to it uh, myself I dabble in it I'm by no means like uh, an expert 
Um, but I do work with some very talented people in my store that know a lot about uh, painting. Uh, we also carry a wide range of painting supplies so that, you know, I basically have the opportunity to kind of play around and mess around with whatever, whatever tools I can kind of get my hands on. Uh, so a little project that we've been working on uh, is the uh, uh, Terra Aegis. For those of you guys that, that don't know, we actually um, have a Terra Aegis and an Artifacts uh, from the Ocular Max line. And yep. Essentially it's you know, Trailbreaker and Hoist. Yeah. And uh, these two um, were kind of like the perfect basis for uh, a custom that uh, me and one of the staff did. We debuted it at TFCon uh, Chicago in 2016, just so people can get a good look at it and mm -hmm. and see some of the details that are on it. But this is a, a good um, uh, kind of a example of taking customizing a little bit further. So unlike the kit bashing that we've been doing before, this one actually had uh, custom parts made for it. Um, and so first we, we kind of took some inspiration. We took a look at, um, you know, uh, where we wanted to go with this. And for every customizer, I think that's kind of something that's really important. You gotta have a kind of yeah. a s story behind yeah. it, right? Basically the inspiration that we kind of had with this uh, product here was to come up with a diaclone repaint scheme for the Terra Aegis. Now, mm. of course, a uh, very obvious one to do would be to turn it blue. Yeah. Um, or to do the yellow version, which was uh, one of the rarer diaclones. But, you know, like with the Mirage, like how we did that as well, I kind of really wanted to do something more interesting than that. So this time around, the Ocular Max guys kind of came, came to me and said, you know, well, what can we do? You know, we know we want to do that repaint. You're saying it's not good enough. What do we got to do to do something like this? And I just said, well, we got to take the spirit of that and kind of twist it a little bit. So after a lot of thought, one of the Ocular Max guys approached me and was like, hey, how about we do a rally version Ooh, of, okay, all right. of the Toyota Hilux? Now, back in the 80s, 70s, the Toyota Hilux was used uh, by Paris Dakar uh, Rally uh, at, you know, it was one of the main kind of Paris Dakar rally vehicles. And after doing a lot of homework and, uh, you know, whatnot on the Paris Dakar uh, rally, I kind of noticed that, like, this was a rally that was done primarily, uh, it, it was a very dry kind of rally. It was done in the sand. Yeah, yeah. Uh, and a lot of the Hilux uh, features were uh, beefed up and uh, kind of assimilated and retooled <clears throat> to kind of match that kind of conditioning. Mm. Uh, everything down to the tires, to the backing. Yeah. They took off the cab back. Although yeah. there have been rallies with the actual, you know, cab back. Yeah. Uh, there was a lot that were kind of like off-road looking. They just had like a whole bunch of extra accessories yeah. that were kind of tied down. And then had the reinforcement bars and uh, the, uh, the nice roll. Uh, roll, roll, roll cage here. Yeah. It was a very interesting uh, looking rally style vehicle. And then it had a lot of decaling, mm -hmm. which, you yeah. know, was obviously a big challenge as well. Yeah. So, you know, how do we take this, modify what we have for the regular uh, Terra Aegis, and then also put on all of the decals mm -hmm. and then also give it like the dirt we want. Yeah, yeah. Um, uh, so luck would have it, we found a version of the uh, Hilux in a yellow uh, that was his model kit. Um, and uh, we kind of, you know, took our inspiration from that. And yeah, it was a very interesting project. Yeah. Uh, we actually, this project took a few people to actually make happen. So, you know, I definitely want to give a shout out to Scott. Uh, uh, he's definitely helped out a lot in terms of all the retooling of all these little parts. Yeah. Uh, the, the little floodlights on the yeah. top, um, or the spotlights on the top, and then the actual uh, transforming roll cage. So we even thought yeah. about like how we would take this roll bar, uh, or this reinforcement bar, and actually 
uh, transform it so that it would tr like actually work in bot mode. So yeah. this thing actually flips up um, cool. and yeah, does a whole bunch of stuff. There's actually things set on magnets. Oh, nice. Uh, so that we can remove it and, wow. and have it all work um, in bot mode. Yeah. Uh, now, obviously, that's parts forming, but yeah. uh, it is a proof of concept mm -hmm. and you know, uh, you know obviously with the intent that if this was ever made yeah uh, we could model something that could work with it yeah yeah uh, he also modeled on like the roll cage and everything like yeah. that the roll bar uh, and um, you know one of our uh, challenges was how do we do it and and not have to retool the whole backing mm-hmm because that's not easy and mm -hmm. it's very costly. Mm -hmm. So uh, one thing we did was instead of using the trail breaker as, uh, or the Terra Aegis as the base, uh, many of you guys will probably notice that that's actually the artifacts Oh yeah, as the base. It's actually kind of a merge of both. Mm -hmm. We use kind of like backing of, um, and the body of uh, artifacts, mm -hmm. but then you notice how Artifacts has all the different arms yes, and the yeah, legs, yeah. which ter uh, Terra Aegis doesn't have. Yeah, yeah. So we needed those. So mm. it still was sort of a semi kit bash yeah. to begin with. And then we had to retool all these pieces. We had yes. to take off the wings, yeah. basically uh, dremel the hell out of that. So, <laughs> so <laughs> it just came right off. Yeah. Um, and then. Uh, remove the tow cable or the tow hitch. Yeah. Um, you know, so give, a, give a better idea of what we did here. Yeah. You can see, then we put on basically the uh, floodlights. Yeah. Scott uh, fashioned over the uh, uh, reinforcement bars as well, mm -hmm. and then actually painted it as well to kind of give it this illusion that it was always meant to be this way, mm -hmm. and then put on a nice little tire fashioned. Yeah. For it. Now, the tire's a little bit big, uh, yeah. but we didn't have anything that <laughs> was this specific scale at yeah, the time. Yeah. Um, hopefully, that's something that we can fix. That was the start of this whole project, mm -hmm. uh, to kit bash that. And then, of course, we had to give it the base layer yeah. of the yellow, yeah. which was a, uh, you know, thanks to uh, Chris Sun on uh, the Ages team, he did a lot of the major paint work on mm -hmm, this. Mm -hmm. uh, as you can see when we turn it around, yeah. you'll see a lot of his paint um, um, skills at work here. Yeah. Uh, all airbrush, of course, so we can get a good even coat. And a lot of sanding. Mm -hmm. uh, that was one thing that both me and him had to do, but he, he unfortunately was stuck with, with most of the job. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> so we had to actually sand it down really, really uh, evenly so that none of these like um, little uh, uh, tampos would show. Yeah. And just to give it this really smooth finish. Wow. Um, yeah, it was. It looks good. It was, it was a lot of work. Yeah. Uh, and then came the decals, uh, which uh, I had a part, I, I had to design up and create and print our own decals. So, you know. Then that required a lot of computer skills as well, mm -hmm. uh, doing a lot of the vectors and everything in Illustrator, uh, getting some of the logos for Ocular Max and Mastermind going on here, and you know the, the numbering to kind of look like that 80s style Dakar mm -hmm. uh, numbering, and then print out our own decals, and then have um, Chris go at it and having to cut out each one for him. I had to cut <laughs> all these little circles to even cover like. You see these little front kind yeah, of yeah. spotlight covers? Wow. Um, I even had to like cover that and like put the decals onto there. Um, so, you know, it was me cutting all of these little things, Ooh. giving it to Chris, and Chris had to take like, you know, little tweezers and like. <laughs> and uh, let me tell you, we were up to like four in the morning <laughs> the day before I had to fly out to uh, TFCon TF to show this thing off. Wow. To get that on. Um, and then. Have after doing all of that, having to actually get in and do the dirt. Oh boy, that was a really tough yeah. uh, thing to do because we had, you know, it was first of all, it's hard to do because we just spent so much time making all this thing look perfect with the decals. Yeah, yeah. And now it's like, where do we start with the dirt? We don't <laughs> even want to dirty it up because yeah. it took so much work to get here. But yeah. you know, no guts, no glory, right? Yeah. So we got onto that and. Um, you know, started putting in the dirt, and it's, we started realizing right away it was really coming 
to the vision that we had had uh, with it all along. Um, and then, you know, the kind of final touches was me going over and, uh, you know, once we'd done all the regular dirt, I was kind of just evening out the dirt so and kind of really getting the the final kind of little details onto everything yeah uh, and then giving it a nice uh, airbrush top coat yeah so that it would lock everything in nicely yeah. Um, so yeah a lot of custom work uh, and uh, you know this is definitely something we're hoping to work with ocular max on to create uh, another uh, great um, uh, you know kind of advanced paint repaint and retooling for the Terra Ages slash artifacts model. Yeah. Um, so yeah, lots of lots of work uh, that went into it. But uh, for all you customizers out there, um, it's you know that's kind of a breakdown of the sort of steps that we we took uh, to to do it. And uh, honestly, a lot of it was just uh, regular tools like you know paint, airbrush. Uh, we just mixed a lot of paints together. A uh, few pointers, make sure you're always writing down your formula. Mm. Uh, otherwise, you will never get that proper yellow yeah. ever again. <laughs> yeah. It's very difficult, actually. Yeah. Um, we primed everything. So you're going to definitely need a primer for some a job like this that you want this kind of consistency throughout. Yeah. Otherwise, you're going to get, especially with this guy here, we did a few tests even on, like, small parts with the green on it the green will just show right through and turn the yellow kind of into a different color so you really have to prime it sand it sorry sand it prime it uh, then you can put the yellow on make sure you're always keeping track of what colors you're mixing yeah uh, and then the dirt you can use like kind of brown paint and do some dry brush techniques yeah, yeah. Uh, or what we did was we just straight up use powder um, we use these powdered yeah uh, Mr. Color kind of oh, weathering okay. effects, yeah, and it Dust. gave it this dust because we needed it to kind of look dusty, like specky, it's, like right? yeah, yeah, because it's not a muddy race. It's, yeah, yeah, it's yeah. In the sand, and yeah. there might be a little bit of moisture, but there's not a whole lot. And yeah, then yeah, we even, if you see, we even like kind of yeah transpose that to that's cool. I like that. Yeah, to the front windows because a lot of it, uh, you know. You get a lot of dust on the windows, yeah. and then you're going to be wiping it with the windshield wipers at certain points. Mm -hmm. But it's a very dry kind of uh, wipe, so yeah. it's not going to be perfect, and we had to kind of replicate that on the windows. Mm -hmm. So a lot going on here, I realize, but uh, wanted to bring anyone that's kind of been inspired to maybe pick up a brush or pick up an airbrush and start doing customizing. Yeah. Or for those who are already into customizing, um, just wanted to kind of give the old push that, you know, this kind of stuff can be done mm -hmm. even at a factory level, uh, as long as there's good proof of concepts, there's, you know, good thought put into it, um, um, before it goes into production. Um, it's really interesting to see how we can push, uh, kind of, uh, repaints to the next level with, uh, certain, uh, transformables. It is, um, definitely... Uh, you know, labor of love for us, um, and uh, we hope to do more. Um, we've done, like I said in the past, we've done the Mirage, and uh, the, the you know we've we've had a couple of those out, and uh, wanted to retire that and try something a little bit new. Well, that was a really cool segment, Boris. But I think a lot of the viewers are really interested on how it all goes down. Yeah, definitely. Uh, you guys got to see the results of everything, and I kind of explained kind of not in context how uh, I do certain techniques and whatnot. Uh, but let's uh, take a look at where the actual magic happens. I do have a small little workshop that I have in my house. Uh, it's not the most ideal one, but at least you can see what it takes and what kind of materials you need to kind of get into this uh, hobby or even modeling in general. Take me to your workshop. Let's do it. Let's see what Boris is up to. Hey, Boris. Hey, what's up, guys? What's up, Alex? Not too much. Just uh, uh, hanging out here, and then I find you uh, in a workshop. Yeah, just cleaning up a little bit here. Uh, I mean, you've, you've always said you wanted to see, like, where I do a lot of my painting. Yep. Uh, I, actually, in the summertime, sometimes I like to sit in the garage, just open up the garage because of all the fumes and everything. Yep. 
But uh, normally this is the actual uh, workshop. A little bit messy right now. I've been uh, doing a little project here. Um, you know, it's a little personal project uh, for my wife. And then there's some like secret stuff going on here. Some people might uh, take a quick look and see what I'm up to and what kind of crazy ideas might be coming up. It's not a lot of room. This is my laundry room actually. <laughs> and slash my cat's uh, litter room. Um, but, uh, <laughs> you know, I am trying to upgrade it. I just got some folding table here, as you can see. But what I am gonna do is I'm upgrading to, like I've got a light, nice little desk. I never use this for jackets anyway, so I'm gonna probably remove that. And, yeah. Uh, throw a desk in there. Um, but basically, this is a really kind of a nice setup because when we moved into this house, they actually had uh, pets. They had a doggy door. Um, and that actually works really great as my little exhaust because there's, you know, first of all, there's a, like this perfect hole that fits my little exhaust pipe, and this is my little spray booth here. It has like this little flap outside that kind of keeps everything in, so it's kind of nice. Uh, and then as you can see, my this is just a portable spray booth. I mean, maybe I can upgrade to something larger when I do larger things, but really I do very small scale, I break everything into pieces, and it's uh, really simple. And then this is your standard. I got, you know, just my airbrush set up here. A couple of airbrushes this is for my fine detail work. This is what I use mainly for all my base coats and everything. And then of course, you know, lots of paint brushes everywhere, right? So there's the uh, Terra Aegis uh, exclusive. <laughs> <laughs> um, oh yeah. But yeah, so you know, I, I I do actually have a lot of people that come in and ask me. You know, uh, any expert at already doing this kind of stuff, customizing or even modeling, uh, all of this very familiar stuff. But for those that are kind of new to this and want to get into it, like a lot of the people at my store come in and ask me, um, you know, kind of, I can kind of just show you the kind of basics you'll kind of need. I mean, with every setup, I'm, if you're trying to get into airbrushing especially, you're going to want to have this kind of a setup. This uh, spray booth is very important uh, because it, uh, it acts as a kind of ventilation for everything going on. Uh, I have the added bonus because I have a big door there I can open up. And then also I have my fan in the washroom that's always on while I'm down here. So there's a lot multiple points of ventilation. And of course, uh, I use a lot of lacquer paints now. So lacquer, you're going to want to get yourself one of these masks. You know, yeah. you don't want to be inhaling this stuff. You're going to go crazy after <laughs> a while and probably die. Yeah. Um, so don't do that. Then, you know, I do all my stuff here. I do all my mixing of paints. Uh, yeah, I noticed uh, that you have these little cups for uh, mixing paints here. Yeah, these are just shooter cups. You get them from the dollar store. You can do anything. I just find them useful because they're tiny. They're disposable. And then do yourself a favor. Go on to Amazon. Get yourself a whole bunch of these scientific pipettes. Yeah. You can get a thousand for super cheap. Yeah. Like this is just half the. Wow, it's five hundred. I've been pieces. using it forever, yeah. and like you know, you just like this is really great because you can measure what you're mixing and all that. Uh, especially with airbrushing, you always have to mix with uh, thinner, with thinner yeah. on your paints. So you're gonna want to have these handy all the time. Something that's also very inte uh, integral to painting is to have a wide assortment of uh, apparatus to kind of hold your uh, products so for example this one's great because this guy here it holds you know kind of shells of models and stuff right i really like this guy here oh that's fantastic you know, spin it around while yeah. you're spraying it right and it clips on the uh clamps on the inside of it that's right yeah so, that's that's cool and then it's adjustable this one's made by tamiya whatever and you can adjust it yeah to be wider thinner yeah whatever you want uh and then this is another cool little carousel it doesn't really offer that much storage but it's great for like larger items like if you want to paint the whole sprue you clamp it in there um uh, and like you know it holds it really nicely and then there you go you kind of just like spray things nice. and, yeah so this is a really great little apparatus and then it has little holes to like stick things in like yep. uh, after you're done a lot of people will hold things with skewers as well yeah yeah so i have a foam that I can stick the skewers in. Yeah. So, you know, this one holds that too. Really quite nice. Uh, so you definitely need apparatus. Uh, you know, get yourself some 
these like thinner skewers. These are like these food skewers, but yeah. they're actually not ideal. They do sell thinner ones that are meant for paints. Um, and those ones are a little bit better and you basically can uh, clip on to anything and uh, with alligator clips or use blue tack. Blue tack is really great too because it's nice and clean. Put blue tack on to any of the skewers and then you stick whatever piece you want onto it and then you can hold it and you know the whole point is to be able to take a piece and be able to rotate it and you know what I mean while you spray it yeah so super useful cool you gotta have this kind of stuff another thing is this dry booth this is not like super important to have but when you're doing projects like I do it's really nice because it dries things really quickly so you can get the next coat on uh, obviously it's not a like a long-term solution like you can't you can't continue to dry things like super quick and expect it to cure fully but once you're done a project you should always let the paint cure for a good four to five days sometimes I find yeah depending on what it is but this is a good solution if you're just trying to put on layers and you don't want to wait three to four hours sometimes this this can has this little timer and then once it's done it'll ding like an yeah. oven <laughs> it actually doesn't make a sound oh. <laughs> i don't know if something's just wrong with mine but whatever uh but it does come with these useful trays so oh you can dry multiple things. things to dry sweet yeah if, if you want to make beef jerky on yeah. top while yeah. you're drying your paint <laughs> probably don't want to eat that beef jerky but you know yeah over on the other side here super simple like i basically have a cutting mat a very large one here mm -hmm. uh, i also have a small one just kind of like when i want to do like little things um, and do it quick uh, but this is really important because you know you want to protect your table first of all and then also when you're cutting for masking or anything like that you know you're gonna need something like this that really really uh, helps everything um, and then a variety of knives uh, is always nice like I have a little set here Uh, these aren't the best knives in the world, honestly, but they're cheap. I find them really useful and basically, you know, you can use some for carving stuff out, extra pieces of plastic, whatever. And then, of course, you know, nothing would be complete without um, sanding apparatus. You always need some sort of, you know, sandpaper and, um, you know, polishing compounds and have those as well this kind of like wet polishing um yeah very good oh and rubber gloves yeah you don't want to get all messy yeah you should always have rubber gloves otherwise your hands are gonna be black these are kind of the basics and what you need um uh and of course if you're making actual model kits sprue cutters are always good um and i would invest in some really good ones if you start getting really into it because uh, there's actually a very big difference. Uh, I use the God Hands. This I kind of use just so I can like get through any rough cuts and like get all that. But uh, this can cut really close to the sprue line and it is it just cuts through everything like butter. And then always have your microfiber cloths. They're always useful to wipe up, wipe down anything. So that's kind of uh, the setup, Alex. Uh, I do everything within this little small area here. Wow. I actually wish I had a lot more room, but you know. Hey, whatever can, works. I've seen people do worse. I've seen people like, like students do it in their little small little room. Yeah, uh, you just gotta work with what you got. Exactly, but just make sure you got good ventilation for any of these things. There's a lot of fumes going on, even if you're not using a lacquer-based paint. It's, it reeks, yeah. right? especially if you're going to use like spray cans. For yeah. Sure. You don't want to do that inside. Yeah. Uh, and if you are going to do that inside, you better have really good ventilation. Yeah. Um, but yeah, highly recommend that uh, if you're starting out, invest in some of the things that you see here. Um, and maybe uh, leave, drop us some comments if you guys want any advice or anything like that. I'm by no means a pro. Uh, however, I have done quite a bit now and, uh, you know, I know exactly what to get. I've tested a lot of products because we do sell it in our store. So that's kind of the nice advantage. I get to be the guinea pig for all these products and see if they're actually worth buying or not. Um, uh, yeah, maybe one day we can do a paint supply review. Ooh, Who knows? Yeah, yeah, yeah. 
So, the, well, thank you so much, Boris. That, like, that was very, very comprehensive. Yeah, absolutely. And, uh, yeah, definitely drop us some comments if you got any questions. Yeah, and stop by the store if you want to see all, all these products in action or That's on, right. on the shelves. <laughs> That's right. So, Boris, it looks like you have something else to show us. Yeah, uh, so talking about customizing Customs. techniques. Yep. Uh, this was, uh, I mean, Fans Project, uh, as you know, has always been come out with really creative pieces yes in my opinion mm -hmm. uh, so you know I wanted to do something with the fans project uh, piece mm -hmm. uh, now I'm, I'm not sure if they'll ever produce something like this this is quite a bit of uh, paint work mm -hmm. believe it or not you can transform this one too nice. I, I took out some of the pins and everything and put them back in <laughs> but uh, it all it all kind of works yeah. um, the nice thing about the the finish on the fans project stuff was mm -hmm. I didn't actually have to sand it mm, okay. too much not even the chrome because yeah. of how it was done yeah um, it, so just so you guys know this is the original uh, just because of the way that it was done <clears throat> um, it kind of lent to how uh, this uh, uh, repaint kind of works yes. with this uh, Grimlock. So essentially what I did here, I mean, is very uh, uh, simple in terms of the steps. Um, mm -hmm. uh, Technique-wise, uh, whatnot, same thing. It's just a whole bunch of airbrushing yes. and dry brushing, but uh, I obviously spent a little bit more time on giving him uh, battle damage. So, uh, you know, again, you have to think about inspiration and how to plan these things out. I got my inspiration from one of the, some of the artwork that was done for this uh, uh, game is a mobile game called Transformers Legends. Oh yes, yes. Yeah, and they had one where King Grimlock was like sitting on you know this kind of stone kind of throne, yeah. and uh, uh, most of him actually looked like this very monocolor mm -hmm. uh, steel gray everywhere, not like your typical Grimlock, but he still had the nice yellow and the red that you're so used to from Grimlock. And this is Fans Project Several, by the way, uh, just for you guys that don't know. Uh, so a lot of things about the original Alex was that a bit of the drive too was not only was I inspired by artwork, but I was inspired because uh, one of the things that the original Severo uh, didn't do very well was its coloration. Okay. Now, not to say it was bad coloring, it's just that the way that it was done, it hides a lot of the detail that uh, is in Grimlock. So, uh, for example, if you take a look at his head sculpt, yes, it's all done in black. Yeah, and so you know, I'm just gonna give you a look at Alex. A yeah, that what this kind of uh, the mask. Looks yeah, like, just so he gets a reference. Yeah, so yeah. So you can see how he's got that like teeth and yeah. and, and kind of like a little extra detail on yeah. his mask. Yeah, right. So a lot of that gets hidden when it's yeah. kind of like the straight black. The straight black and yeah. So yeah, you, you don't see, really even notice that at all. You don't all. even notice. All you really see is the shape and the silhouette of his mask. Yeah. Um, <clears throat> and then all the details kind of get lost in it. And that's the crappy thing about um, uh, black plastic. A lot of times you don't even notice these things are going on. Yeah. Uh, it takes a little bit to kind of notice that there's these pipes these mm -hmm. exhaust pipes that come out of his yeah. arms. Uh, and then the same thing with his hands, these little knuckle dusters yes. that are actually there yeah. <laughs> aren't immediately evident because it's black. So this gave me a real kind of challenge. How do I bring out those really awesome design points mm -hmm. that several actually had while, you know, making it less busy with the rest of the... Uh, uh, the paint applications and all yeah. these, like, like clear uh, red pieces and yeah. all this. Um, so I kind of went to work with merging that artwork with uh, you know things that I found were lacking um, uh, in bringing out the detail. And it, it basically resulted in this here. So at first we started with, it was actually all gray mm -hmm. and just your primary colors, the yes. yellow and the red. Yeah. It had no details on it and mm -hmm. it looked actually quite phenomenal even at that point it brought out a lot of the details in, in this kind of a gunmetal kind of gray. Yeah. And then I, I went to it with uh, dry brushing. It was a lot of dry brushing. Yeah. And just getting a lot of this kind of um, kind of slight battle damaging. I didn't want to get too too overboard because yeah, yeah. then it just 
kind of takes away from yeah. the whole thing. Yeah. Um, but gave it some minor vandal da damage, and um, it was all actually dry brush effects. I didn't even get in there and wreck the plastic because I, I don't have the uh, uh, I didn't have the heart to on this piece to <laughs> actually carve <laughs> into it. Um, and then one thing that I really incorporated into this one was we did a lot of masking. So mm. I worked. Uh, again, with one of my really talented guys here, uh, Chris Sun, he helped to um, help kind of lay the base down for it. Uh, I really directed more of the color scheme that mm -hmm. I wanted yeah. and then helped out with a lot of the detailing. Mm -hmm. um, and then a lot of the detailing, it really came down to um, um, a lot of these little details to really make this thing shine. Uh, like the flame sword. Yeah, that is cool. I was for a moment I was uh, trying to figure out how you even achieve that effect, but it's a uh, it's orange first and then spray painting. Is that right? That's right. Yeah, yeah, that's right. And uh, it's funny because when we finally had the final result, you know, me and Chris are just blown away. We're like, <laughs> man, that was, that was a little simpler than we yeah, thought. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, but it works. Yeah. Right. Uh, same thing with these lights down yeah. here, like the little blue yeah, lighting effects. That's cool. Uh, you know, that was kind of just, you know, kind of laying down a base layer of blue. Yeah. And then me going with a really fine tip and going yeah. over top of it to, yeah, yeah, to yeah. kind of make the lights. Yeah. I actually learned on the spot how to do that because I was just like, what would lights look like? I had a little bit of yeah. a reference and then went, went on to it. Uh, but the funny thing about the sword was I actually messed it up. I had dropped it, oh. and then it, and then this is the worst part. Okay, I dropped it, and then it hit like my little like shooter cup of uh, thinner. I had okay, all right. Thinner that I was using yeah. to uh, thin out yeah. uh, certain applications, and of course. It didn't spill on it completely, but drops of it had like flown and out yeah. of the cup, yeah. and I didn't realize. Yeah, yeah. And it had settled on there, so I didn't notice it oh. at first. And then I looked, and I was like, "What happened here? This <laughs> sword looks like totally like messed up now." Oh crap! Uh, so I had to respray it. Oh, exactly the same. So I actually had to learn the same technique. Yeah, yeah. That Chris had. Well, uh, at least you got your practice in. <laughs> I got my practice in, and it actually worked out really well. Yeah. And, it, and when he looked at it, I was like, yeah, you know, he didn't even notice it. Yeah. And that's how I kind of knew. Yeah. I was like, yes. Yes. I did it right. Yeah. Uh, and then I told him afterwards, I'm like, uh, I actually had to redo the whole sword because <laughs> I like, messed you it did? up. <laughs> yeah, he was uh, actually quite surprised yeah. that it, uh, it turned out. Then it became this kind of um, real test in masking. Mm -hmm. Like, Chris masked a lot of like these like little shoulder details to get mm. the little yeah. uh, gradient in there. You'll notice there's kind of like a flame kind of effect going yeah, on in there yeah. too. The yellow into the uh, red and sort of the orange and then the red. Yeah. Um, a lot of even these like m very little mini details along his feet here. Yeah. Uh, masked out so that we can get the right uh, parts painted. Yeah. Uh, same thing with uh, kind of his lower torso. Mm -hmm. There's a lot of detail that's uh, easy to miss, like on the back mm -hmm. and everything. I went in there and masked <laughs> it and did all those little things. Yeah. Uh, and then I even like made the exhaust have these kind of anodized oh, yeah, I love that. piping effect. That's um, great. I mean, like there's nothing on here. <laughs> yeah, exactly. So, you know, that really brought out the pipes, right? Mm -hmm. It really makes the, those exhausts kind of stand out. And yeah. now you know that Hey, he's actually got these exhaust pipes on there. That's yeah. kind of uh, kind of cool. Mm -hmm. uh, so yeah, it's definitely something that you know I really um, uh, enjoyed working with Chris on. Um, but this is kind of the stuff that I feel like uh, you know if you're not happy entirely with a paint job um, of these third party products that you get out there, um, even the official ones. I, I just say the third party because sometimes I feel like. Uh, because of time constraints, maybe production constraints too, costs. Uh, you know, third-party products are already expensive enough. Um, sometimes they, you know, some of these decisions with the plastic coloring and all that, they're made because of those budget constraints. Mm -hmm. And you just can't have it all. It sucks to lose some of that yeah. design detail that these, uh, you know amazing designers actually put into it yeah. and it's easy to overlook sometimes so when you actually get a chance to take apart something and repaint it and bring out the detail that's actually in there um i feel it's like a, it's a real tribute yeah. to the uh, designer that that does it because it lets them know and it gives them a nod that hey 
you know, I noticed these things, yeah. uh, even though I know that it wasn't possible during yeah. production yeah. to bring these things out. Yeah. Uh, I noticed them, so I'm going to do that, and yeah. I'm going to bring that out. So, yeah, this was a real kind of exercise in that, uh, and this is just purely for the love of just wanting to have an awesome-looking uh, Grimlock. Yeah, when you're doing that, it feels like you're you're giving justice to the sculpt. Mm -hmm. Yeah, because, I mean, the designer put so much work on in it, and but then, like, they're all hidden in dark black paint <laughs> yeah so it's it's definitely a, a great way to really showcase those features which should have been showcased the first time yeah that's right and uh yeah so that that just shows some simple techniques that yeah. you can do if you got a proper airbrush set up just with a little bit of practice I, like i said i'm by no mean, means an expert but a patient uh did a lot of masking as well masking is your friend if yeah. you want some really good clean work yeah um you know i and it extends to other things too. Just just to talk about a little bit more of masking and airbrushing. Yeah. Like uh, we have uh, at our oh, shop, yes. we have a lot of people that are into this new game that's taking over. It's yeah. uh, called X Wing. Yeah. Um, of course, it's a Star Wars kind of dogfight simulator, basically. Yeah. Uh, war game. It's got these rulers and whatnot. You build your fleet. Yeah. And then you can attack. Uh, they already come pre-painted, but I, you know, I thought I'd kind of customize one. And the same thing, this took a lot of patience. Yeah. I did this one all myself. It wasn't a project big enough to warrant uh, getting Chris to help out on. But uh, yeah, I did all this like masking to make sure like the Stormtrooper tro stencil was on there. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, turned it into gunmetal. Basically, my inspiration for this was the Lambda shuttle. I thought, yeah. what's, what's more iconic <laughs> than the Astro Train? shuttle space shuttle yeah yeah, yeah. um <laughs> so yeah made him the astro train colors uh spent a lot of time detailing out uh masking effects and then yeah. the lighting again that i had figured out on the grimlock uh, applied to a lot of the lighting on the lambda yeah um and you know this is really just you know what it is if you got the patience uh, to go through it. This is really not a lot of techniques going on here. Just the dry brushing, the airbrush, um, and then some patience and masking. Um, and, uh, you know, you get a result like this. Um, and, of course, I don't want to downplay it. It does take a lot of patience, you know, to, oh, to do yeah. things like that. But you can <laughs> you see, uh, you know, I did the stencil. Uh, but honestly, the stencil wasn't that hard. You just buy these really big masking yeah. sheets yeah. and you print the decal right onto it and then you just cut it and you don't even have to be perfect to be honest like cuz once you once you like get in the groove even yeah. if you like kind of like cut it a little bit over like that yeah. imperial logo yeah. it's by no means perfect but once you stencil it on like you, you paste it on there and you airbrush you're not going to notice man yeah 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 you do a little bit of weathering yeah not even going to notice so um, this was a real test in how I could uh, get all those effects kind of happening. Yeah. Um, so yeah, and then on this side I have the Decepticon. Logo oh yeah, it's stenciled in. It gives it this kind of uh, cool little appeal, and uh, you know when you know my guys are in the tournaments playing X-wing, they can represent the shop fully because it's you know yeah. your Transformers X-wing. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, and I, I hope that I can I have time to do up some more so we can actually have a full fleet of. <laughs> Decepticon. Decepticon. <laughs> Decepticon Empire. <laughs> Imperial ships, that's yeah. right. Um, but yeah, just wanted to kind of share some, uh, just some of the process with you guys that are into this. And uh, I hope uh, this kind of customizing episode, I know we don't do very many of them, yeah. uh, maybe one a season, but hopefully this kind of uh, inspires uh, you guys to either continue doing it or um, uh, if you haven't yet, you know. Uh, now's the time really yeah. it's it's a lot of fun and yeah. it's really really rewarding when you can do something really really cool for yourself yeah and the yeah. first step really is to uh give it a shot yeah that's just right. do it that's right so yeah uh definitely if you have any questions about customizing whatever leave it in the comments uh below on this video yeah uh i'll be more than happy to share with you guys uh some of the uh, you know little bit of knowledge that I actually do have on this subject. Thank you. And that's our episode for today. We hope you enjoyed it. What's coming up next? TFCon. Man, I'm excited. Are you excited? Yeah, I'm, I'm totally pumped. I'm, uh, I'm pumped. It's a great show. And if, in fact, if you guys are in the Toronto area, July 13th, 
uh, the in the Mississauga Hilton Hotel. Yep. That's where they're holding it. Mm -hmm. uh, me and Alex will be there, so yeah. you can come meet us. Yeah. Come chat with us. Yeah. If you're not gonna be there, don't worry. We're gonna have a lot of coverage of the show. Yeah. Uh, we're gonna do a lot of they have a lot of reveals there for third party uh -huh. stuff, some reviews, and then just general. Us goofing around and showing you the TFCon experience. Oh yeah, we're going to have a lot of fun. So stay tuned for those episodes. We got you covered. So, as always, if you enjoyed this episode and you want to see more, hit that like button. Subscribe to the YouTube channel. Like us on Facebook, Ages 3 and Up. And also follow us on Twitter at Ages 3 and Up. We'll see you later. See you next time. Peace. We got you covered because that's why we're doing this. We're here to have fun with you guys. And then, you know, you guys are enjoying the... And that's our episode for today. We hope you enjoyed it. I'm we sorry. got Kiev... I was, doing, I was oh. doing something totally weird. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> I know, I know. Me, me and Alex, chat with us. Whatever. Whatever you want to do. I don't know what I'm going to say. 